Are the Broncos actually going to trade up? This is not a new question. This is not really a new topic. But we do have a new twist in the story because NFL insider Ian Rappaport name-dropped two to three teams that he thinks has a real shot of moving from outside the top ten, inside the top ten to get a quarterback, and he mentioned the Broncos. So I want to read to you guys what Rapsheet said, and then I'll react to it. Ian Rappaport said, We already know the Minnesota Vikings are a potential trade-up team for a quarterback when they acquire that extra first-round pick after that fascinating trade with the Houston Texans. I asked Sean Payton, would he consider them, being the Broncos, a realistic team to move up? And he said, absolutely. He does consider them a team to potentially move up. I would keep my eye on both these teams and the Raiders. So the question becomes, just how realistic is a trade-up? Because this is not some brand new idea, and we've discussed it before on the channel. But after the Stefan Diggs trade today, I felt like it would be a good time to loosely reassess how realistic it may be because, as we learned a few hours ago, expect the unexpected in the NFL. So when you look at the NFL draft order, you're talking about making a move to somewhere between three to six, maybe tossing seven and eight. But just for today, let's zero in on Patriots and Cardinals because Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers are just not going to trade with Denver. I refuse to believe that has any possibility. So now we can kind of zero in on just number three and number four. The easiest path for the Broncos to move up and get a quarterback would be if the Patriots and the Cardinals trade down, right? The Vikings go up to number three. They have a better offer than Denver. They get the pick from the Patriots. They go Drake May. The Broncos go to four. They get J.J. McCarthy, and everyone's happy, right? New England, Arizona, they get a boatload of draft picks. Minnesota and Denver get the quarterback of their future. Like, everyone in that situation comes out somewhat smiling, depending on if you're a Patriots fan and you want to trade down. That's the easiest path. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the Patriots are staying put at number three. So now you've got two teams in the Broncos and the Vikings competing for one spot. And right there, we can kind of end the conversation because – how in the heck does Denver make a better offer than Minnesota? The Vikings picked before the Broncos, so a pick swap would favor Minnesota. And the Vikings have an extra first-round pick this year. Well, since we just talked about Stefan Diggs and the unexpected, here are two ways I could see Denver maybe besting an offer from the Minnesota Vikings. Number one, desperation. Sean Payton ate. $85 million dead cap hit to move on from Russell Wilson. Something tells me he had bigger goals at the quarterback position this offseason than just rolling into next year with Jared Stidham and Ben DiNucci. It has been reported that the Broncos were in on Sam Darnold and Sam Howell, both quarterbacks they made offers to and they missed out on. The Seahawks made a better trade offer than the Broncos did, and Sam Darnold picked the Vikings over the Broncos because of a better opportunity to play with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison in Minnesota. So we know Sean Payton is looking for a quarterback, and he has won and missed two times. Is he going to strike out? He may not want to, and he may get desperate. I don't think things are going to plan for Sean Payton. I don't think if you told Sean Payton on the day they released Russell Wilson that their quarterback room would look the exact same a month and a half later. So I think Sean Payton may have a little bit of desperation creep in, where he does not want to miss out yet again for a third time on moving up to get a quarterback. So how does that mean the Broncos get a better opportunity than the Vikings to move up in the draft? He may simply just keep one-upping one the Vikings' offer, right? If the Cardinals are smart, they would just ping-pong offers between Denver and Minnesota, and every time the Vikings made an offer, they would bring that offer to Denver, and Sean Payton would add a little bit more. And that's probably going to result in a massive overpay, but that is a way the Broncos could move up. Desperation from Sean Payton creeping in, doesn't want to miss out on a third quarterback, so he just simply makes an offer the Vikings can't top and the Cardinals can't refuse. Way number two, if you're Arizona, and you're looking at the two teams, not necessarily the offers, but the teams, and the Broncos and the Vikings. I mean, when you look at the trade offers that both these sides can make, 
They both have a lot of first-round picks, right? Vikings have two this year. Broncos have a first this year, and then two first the next two seasons. Same for Minnesota. But I just kind of wonder, what if the Cardinals think we could take the Vikings' 23rd overall pick this year, but we could also get Denver's first-round pick next year, and we think that 2025 first-round pick from Denver will be a better pick than the 23rd overall pick in this year's draft, right? If I'm the Cardinals, would you rather have pick 11 and 23 this year or 12 and a future first from Denver next season? They may think the Broncos' first overall, the first round pick next year, and I think it's a pretty good theory to have here, will be a lot lower than the 23rd overall pick this year. Plus, I mean, we just saw Stefan Diggs get traded for a future second. The Houston Texans have the 10th overall pick in round number two of this year's draft. Did the Bills pass on that? Was that not up for grabs? I would have to imagine if Buffalo was moving on from Stephon Diggs and Houston was willing to give up a second rounder, they wouldn't let the difference of a 2024 and a 2025 second rounder get in the way. So maybe teams are not looking at this draft class with a lot of confidence in it. And they'd rather have picks in next year's draft class. So maybe the Vikings, sure, could make a good offer with picks 11 and 23. A great offer, actually. But maybe the Cardinals go, we don't want the 23rd overall pick this year as one of the three first rounders we're going to get. Because we think that if we go with the Broncos offer, that first round pick next year could be a lot closer to pick number one than pick 32. So the question really becomes, if you're Arizona... Who do you think will suck more with J.J. McCarthy? Denver or Minnesota? They may feel like Minnesota with Sam Darnold and Justin Jefferson and a pretty solid defense will yield a much worse draft pick for them in the 2025 draft than the Broncos who would be tossing out J.J. McCarthy with Jared Stidham and Cortland Sutton as his number one target and an average defense, right? Solid, but... I, there's nothing really too spectacular. So if the Cardinals decide, you know, we actually would rather have more future first because we don't even like this draft all that much, and we think the Broncos pick next year could be somewhere around pick number 10 compared to pick 23 this year, they may just say, sorry to Minnesota, we're going to actually take the Broncos offer because we don't want your 23rd overall pick this year. It's not that great of a draft class. And we think that Denver's first-round pick next year will be much better than the 23rd overall pick this year. Now, how much of that do you believe? I don't know. But I think those are the two most logistical and like reasonable paths for Denver somehow creeping ahead of Minnesota in an effort to land the fourth or third overall pick in the draft. So let me know what you think. Will the Broncos trade up, yes or no? Get in the comment section. I want to hear your thoughts on this question. I don't think it's going to happen still. I just think that despite my little diatribe, ultimately the Vikings are going to put together a better offer than the Broncos. And if Arizona's willing to move back, I bet they'd rather go from 4 to 11 than 4 to 12 and maybe try and move up again and get a wide receiver. Now, what if Arizona stays put? What if the Cardinals decide... We want to just stay right here where we are and go with Marvin Harrison Jr. And J.J. McCarthy is available starting at pick number five and beyond because we saw Drake May or Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels go one, two, three. And Arizona goes Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors. And now the race is really on to move up to top five or to number five through ten. We'll talk about that next on the show. But first, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor today, which is Game Time. Spring is here, which means we've got some baseball to watch. We've got Nuggets playoff basketball soon. Same with the Avs. And I don't want you guys to miss any of the action because of ticket prices. With game time, you can get killer last-minute deals and all-in prices for all the big events. All you have to do is download the game time app and then use code CHATSPORTS for $20 off your first purchase. I like to look at this as if you download game time, use that code CHATSPORTS, and you show up to a Nuggets game, Game Time pretty much just bought your first round at the concession stand with that $20 savings. It's the best place to find last-minute seats. Download the Game Time app today, create an account, 
and use code chat sports for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, but again, that code is C-H-A-T sports for $20 off. I put all that information in the comments and description of today's video. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So like I was saying a moment ago, let's just say it goes Caleb Williams, Drake May, and then Jaden Daniels. And that's what I believe is going to happen. And then the draft really starts with the Cardinals. Do they stay put? Do they trade out? What if they decide, we want to give Kyler Murray the best tools to work with, we're going to play it safe and just go take Marvin Harrison? Well, now you've got the Chargers at five, Giants, Titans, Falcons, and Bears. None of those teams really need a quarterback. You can make an argument for the Giants, but it doesn't really seem to be a lot of smoke coming out of New York that they want to go QB. So if all those teams are willing to trade out for a QB needy team to move up, then there is a path for the Broncos, but then you got to ask yourself, once again, what offer can they make that's better than the Vikings? For me, I think the most realistic plausible path, and I don't even think it's all that realistic, is somehow the Vikings strike a deal with the Patriots. And Gerard Mayo decides, I don't want to pick a three. I want to stockpile picks for the future. It's my first year. This is a great opportunity to set me to set myself up for you know future success with loads of picks uh, in the next two or three drafts. So Vikings go up to three. They get Drake May or Jaden Daniels. And now the Broncos can kind of take their foot off the gas because you know Arizona's not going QB. And you know the Chargers aren't going to trade with you. And I don't think Jim Harbaugh is going to take J.J. McCarthy as much as he might want to. He's got Justin Herbert. So now Denver, instead of having to give up a boatload of picks to go from 12 to 4, well, now it's from 12 to 6. And that's a lot easier of a price to stomach. So in my estimation, the most realistic path is somehow the Patriots decide to move out, which I don't think is going to happen. But again, all this seems like a bit of a long shot for Denver to get done. And then the Broncos give a call to the Giants, Titans, or Falcons, right? Guys picking 6, 7, and 8. And they, draw, they jump from 12 to 6, 7, or 8, somewhere in that range. And if that does happen, well, not if that does happen. My prediction, like I've been kind of hinting at all along here, is I think the Broncos actually don't go up. I think they go down. I think they go from 12 somewhere back. And they go get some more day two draft picks. And then with that newly acquired second round draft pick, the question becomes, do you want to go get Bo Nix or do you want to go get Michael Penix? And we're going to take a deep dive on these two quarterbacks next up on the show here. But if you had to pick one of the two, which one would it be? It seems relatively split. So don't be afraid to get in the comment section. I want to see which quarterback gets the most votes, Bo Nix or Michael Penix. My, my pick would be Michael Penix. Now, Denver had him in for a pre-draft visit at the start of this week. The big question for Penix was, can he pass the medicals? He had two season-ending shoulder injuries and two season-ending knee injuries at Indiana. Now, two years at Washington, clean bill of health, NFL doctors, give him the thumbs up. So I'm a lot more comfortable with the round two, maybe even round three selection of Michael Penix, and that would be my preferred quarterback for the Broncos in day two of the draft, assuming they don't move up in day one. And when you look at Penix over the last four seasons, and really specifically the last two at Washington where he played the entire season both times. I mean, 4,600-plus yards back-to-back, -back, uh, 35 touchdowns, 39 touchdowns the following season, led the Washington Huskies to the national championship game. There is a lot to like about Michael Penix. For me, the thing that really catches my attention, and we've shown this uh, the, these stats before for Bo Nix and J.J. McCarthy, but I want to share them with you now, is where is Michael Penix throwing the football? Bo Nix was a big check down guy at Oregon. Let his skilled players do the rest yards after catch. You look at Michael Penix. I mean, he threw 117 passes, one in every five, over 20 yards last year. So he's not afraid to have some gunslinger mentality. Now, if I'm Sean Payton, sure, you want a guy that can get the job done over the middle of the field, and that's something that they didn't really get from Russell Wilson last year. But I also think you want to have a bit of a dog in your quarterback, right? A guy that's not afraid to go for the big for the big ball because in the NFL you can't win just in dink and dunks and I think that's what Bo Nix's game is predicated on. So that's why I want to go with Michael Penix, a much bigger volume 
in a very successful volume of his medium to deep passes, while you look at his short passes, still made up a majority of all of his throws last season. All right, before we get you guys on out of here, we are doing 21 reasons to be optimistic for 2024 after reaching 21,000 subscribers, and we are down to reason number two, and it's Patrick Sertan. And I'm a big fan of PS2. I do not want to see the Broncos trade Patrick Sertan to move up in the draft. I think he is that special and truly generational of a player. And when you look at his stats, I mean, just by the numbers alone, they look like an all-time cornerback. But when you take a big, a big, a bigger, oh no, a bigger, I can't even speak right now. You deep a little digger. Oh my gosh, dig a little deeper. This is making for awful radio at the moment. When you dig a little bit deeper, Patrick Sertan in his coverage stats last year. That's what I want to get across here. As I'm trying to spit this out. When you look at what he put up a season ago in coverage and take out the Week Three game against the Miami Dolphins because. That game's tape should just be burned to ashes. He gave up 50 grabs off of 90 targets, nearly 50% completion percentage. I mean, just kind of think about that for a second. One in every two times a quarterback threw to a receiver guarded by Patrick Sertan, the quarterback might as well just thrown it in the dirt because it wasn't going to get completed. 558 yards allowed and two touchdowns. And then I took a bit of a deeper dive. Yep, I'm really in my head right now. And what I wanted to do was compare Patrick Sertan's first three seasons to some of the other all pros of the game. Darrell Revis, Richard Sherman, Jalen Ramsey, Patrick Peterson. And what I have here is through the first three seasons of all their NFL careers, the amount of games they gave up 100 or more yards in coverage. Happened twice to Patrick Sertan so far, twice to Revis, twice to Sherman. 2 x that for Jalen Ramsey, four times, and Patrick Peterson. These guys aren't bad, right? These are borderline future Hall of Fame cornerbacks. I mean, they're just that good of players. And Patrick Sertan is hanging out with Hall of Fame cornerbacks in Darrell Revis and Richard Sherman. So when you find Hall of Fame talent and they are that young, I don't think you move on from them. I, I think that is a trade that no matter what happens in the future, you are just going to regret because you're not going to find another Patrick Sertan with whatever draft picks you get in return. So what's the point of trading him away to get picks just to try and replace him and fail at that. Not interested. All right, that will do it for us on today's show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're going to sign off. Let you guys get back to the rest of your day, and we'll catch up later.